Chapter 12. Sarah Althea Hill had just come from a private conference with Judge Terry when she ran into Emperor Norton on Powell Street. It flashed through her mind that this person was always turned up underfoot at the most inopportune moments. However, she greeted him with a show of warmth. Still inspecting the streets, Your Majesty? <clears throat> yes, I'm afraid the sweepers could be doing better. I hope you will take no offense, madam, but you're looking a bit pale. Do I find you will? Do I find you well? She fluttered her fan. Today was hot. I am well, only a bit irritated. I've just come from an unsatisfactory legal consultation about a personal matter. Ah, I seem to recall having been at one time involved with attorneys myself. It cost me a fortune. But then I became emperor, so it's of no matter now. Is there any way I might help? You may walk with me a bit. Perhaps you might help me to calm myself. She had changed her mind about his company. She sometimes thought of the emperor as something like a good-natured dog. She could say anything to him, and he would listen without casting judgment. Not that she entirely trusted this man. She would still guard her tongue. How is your courtship with the queen coming along? Slowly, I'm afraid, but it progresses. Victoria still wires me on frequent occasions. Sarah had heard that other unknown persons had learned about the joke and took it upon themselves to send more telegrams from the queen. To the emperor, they were no joke. Sarah still didn't quite know what to make of them or him. However, now that I think of it, Joshua went on, I might do well to consult my attorney friend Mr. Buxby about another matter altogether. A situation seems to have arisen involving our mutual acquaintance, Mrs. Marina Randall. This drew Sarah's attention. Really? Is she in some legal trouble? Oh, no, not a bit of it. It's more of an ethical dilemma. But I shall say no more, lest I break confidence. Of course, mum's the word. Sarah made up her mind to nose around Marina's circle. One never knew when a scrap of information might prove useful. Dear Diary, Today I consulted Judge Terry in his professional role as attorney at law. Come to think of it, isn't it odd that he is still called Judge? though he has not held that position for years. I suppose it's like calling a man captain or general after he is retired from the military, but that is neither here nor there. I told Mr. Terry I am not comfortable via vis my relations with Mr. Sharon. We discussed the possibility of suing for breach of promise. Mr. Terry was not encouraging, but told me to wait. He said to see what the senator will do next. He said there is still hope, but somehow I feel at a loose end. I have been thinking about why it is I have come to regard you, dear diary, as almost another person. It is because, in truth, I have no one else in whom to confide. I did confess to Mr. Terry a few of the voodoo rituals undertaken toward Mr. Sharon, but I could not reveal anything. There is no one else in the world to whom I might reveal all my thoughts, save my diary. Now I think of it, I am almost comfortable conversing with Emperor Norton. How odd. Still, even him I would not tell everything. I must look into this matter regarding Marina. My curiosity grows. Buxby, as a junior member of his firm, did not rate a private office. He did, however, have a desk. Other people in the same room gave him curious glances when the emperor showed up. Joshua sat smartly at attention, cradling in his lap his hand-carved walking stick and his new beaver hat with ostrich plumes. Both men spoke in low tones so as not to be overheard. For Joshua, a low tone was relative. Most of Buxby's co-workers could hear without straining to listen. So there you have it. Joshua said, this friend of mine, to remain nameless, finds herself in a quandary. She remarried in all innocence, believing her former husband deceased. Is she guilty of bigamy? There's the long and the short of it. 
Joshua had provided enough details that Buxby had no need to guess at Marina's identity. He glanced at the other half-dozen men in the room who were pretending not to listen, and wagered that within a day or so Marina's predicament would be known all over town. He picked up a pencil and scrawled one word on a yellow pad. Bigamy. He had jotted down a few other words during Joshua's narration. One of them was Simon. <clears throat> I, I can think of at least one interesting historical precedent, he mused. Andrew Jackson's wife, a, a case of accidental bigamy. Trying to keep his voice low, he leaned close and asked, What is his full name? I mean, this person, Simon. Harker, Joshua spat the name. Across the room, a file clerk gave a start at the sound. His name is Simon A. Harker. Buxby wrote down the name. And you say he is from Los Angeles? No, sir, I did not. I said he is arriving by rail from that city. We do not know where he has been residing for the past several years. Uh, I see. Buxby toyed a moment with the pencil. Very well, your majesty. I shall see what I can do. I will need to make some inquiries. If you should acquire any further information about this Simon Harker, please advise me as soon as possible. I am especially concerned with knowing his prior whereabouts. What I mean to say, where has he been living and what's he been doing all this time? You understand? Certainly, sir. I shall endeavor to find out. He made to rise. I am happy to pay in advance for your services if you will accept my personal script. It pays 7% interest and... Yes, yes. Bixby glanced about, hoping the senior partners were not paying attention. That will be acceptable, your majesty. But you needn't pay us now. We can settle up later. Joshua bowed, then turned and bowed again to the rest of the room before taking his departure. There is something wrong, Heather said. Mr. Bannock leaned back in his swivel chair and gave her a long look. <clears throat> There's always something wrong somewhere, young lady. Perhaps you could be more specific. I'm afraid not. My ma isn't talking. I guess she thinks it's something I'm not supposed to know about. She's always assuming I'm too young to understand. She's making a big mistake. She may live to regret not telling me. Mr. Bannock took this girl seriously. And why is that? Why would she regret it? Because if she told me what the trouble is and asked me to keep it under my hat, I would. But if I can find out on my own, I will be under no such constraint. I might well compose some sort of notice for the bulletin or the Alta. The papers are always on the lookout for some juicy scandal especially about someone like the famous Marina. Bannock did not smile. He took this girl seriously indeed. Well then, what leads you to believe there is something amiss? <clears throat> the way she's always writing notes and sending them off. I know she's had long talks with the emperor. When I enter the room, they stop talking. Then they start discussing something trivial. There's something in the air. I can smell it. Well, then, if you should discover what it is and compose a notice, I may well print it. We do appreciate a juicy scandal. Please let me know at once. Heather frowned. I was hoping you might have some idea what's going on. I know you talked to the emperor. Bannock shrugged and picked up a cigar. No idea. But if I find out, I'll let you know. Heather's sense of unrest grew, especially when her mother suggested she go and visit with Ina Colbreth for a few days. <clears throat> Heather did not exactly refuse, nor did she at once pack her bags. She would leave when Marina insisted, but not before. Meanwhile, she found occasion to consult with Gladys one day in the kitchen. <clears throat> I'm sure I wouldn't have no idea what troubles your ma. Gladys answered Heather's question. Nor is it any of my business, nor yours either, I guess. Nor would I say if I knew. Heather shrugged. Oh, well, 
I suppose it's nothing important. I'm sure you wouldn't know about it anyway. She moved as if to exit toward the dining room. The kitchen was redolent with the odor of a baking apple pie. Then again, Gladys said, I does hear a little gossip now and then. Not that I would ever pass it on. Heather paused on her way out. Gossip, you say? Well, Gladys was studying the surface of the coal stove. I done heard somewhere that your ma was expecting a visitor. Some sort of unwelcome visitor, I heard. But that's only what I heard. Ah, an unwelcome visitor. Wonder who that might be. Any idea, Gladys? No, ma'am. Not a one. And doesn't you mention I said nothing. Thanks, Gladys. That was on Monday. On Tuesday morning, a messenger came to the door with a note for Marina. She tore it open and scanned it quickly. <clears throat> Any reply, ma'am? She stared for a moment at the boy waiting on the stairs. Finally, she dug a copper coin from her reticule and handed it to him. Not now, but come back tomorrow at noon. I'll have a reply ready then. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. He tipped his hat and departed. Marina turned and went to her parlor, where she seated herself at the writing desk. She withdrew a note paper and began addressing it to an attorney who had been recommended to her. She stopped halfway through, crumpled the paper, and threw it away. Then she spent several minutes staring into space. Coming to a decision, she stood and rang the bell for Gladys. <clears throat> I'm going out, Gladys. If there are any visitors, tell them I'll return by supper time. Gladys nodded. <clears throat> and may we know where you're bound, ma'am? Marina hesitated. I suppose I can tell you. But don't mention it to anyone else. I'm going out to look for the emperor. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. I'll keep your supper warm. Marina paused on her way out the door. She turned back. Where's Heather, by the way? In a room, studying, I think. But she wasn't. Heather was, in fact, in a nearby coat closet, hearing everything and watching through the partly open door. When Marina and Gladys were both gone, she went to the writing desk in the parlor. She found the note easily. <clears throat> the Honorable Simon A. Harker is desirous of an interview with Miss Marina at her convenience. Please reply to Valencia Hotel. Heather read the note twice. She also read the unfinished letter in the waste basket. There was something wrong. Miss Marina had been her mother's stage name before Heather was born. Since then, she had called herself Mrs. Randall. She wondered what conclusion to draw. Perhaps this Harker was someone who had known her in past years. She made up her mind to see the emperor herself. Chapter 13 Sarah sat in Mary Ellen's parlor, studying the other woman's face. Growing older, the woman only seemed to increase in dignity and power. Her complexion was darker. Sarah had heard she was staining her skin with walnut oil. Sarah had no idea why, nor did she wish to ask. She knew Mr. Terry highly disapproved of Sarah speaking to this lady, but then he need not know everything. Mary Ellen put down her cup of tea at last and looked across at Sarah. <clears throat> you must know I do not deal in scandal, rumor, or gossip. Do you wish to tell me why you need this information? Sarah had prepared an answer. You may not be aware that Miss Marina and I are very old and close friends. Of course, neither of us wishes to advertise the fact, given our mutual no notoriety. For some reason, she has been unwilling to confide her problem in me. This fact leads me to suspect she may be in a deal of trouble. I wish to discover her difficulty so that I may find some way to be of assistance. On the other hand, if there's nothing I can do to help, I would know that as well. Mary Ellen nodded. 
I should tell you what I think. I believe you wish to discover Miss Marina's secret so that you might gain some advantage. Perhaps it is a matter of blackmail. Do not make faces at me. More likely you wish to put this lady somehow in your debt so that in the future you may reclaim a favor. This is how I read your own character. Be that as it may, I will fulfill your request. She paused for another sip of tea, watching Sarah over the cup rim. Sarah felt her own face turning red. You say the emperor has gone to consult with this Mr. Buxby, the attorney. I'm aware of him have several informants in the homes of people who work with him, though not in his own rooming house. Come back to me the day after tomorrow. I should have news by then. Sarah dismissed, arose. <clears throat> Sarah dismissed, arose. It occurred to her to wonder what favor Mary Ellen might one day choose to reclaim from herself. Marina rode the Clay Street cable car down the hill to the commercial district. The car had already been running for two years, but she still wondered each time she boarded if the cable were about to break. She supposed this was another sign of progress, like the railroad and telegraph. She would have to get used to it, as long as she didn't have to travel by balloon. The emperor of the United States was not at home, nor did his landlord know of Norton's whereabouts. Marina decided to wait a while in the parlor in hopes of his return. She sat for an hour with nothing to do but stare out the window. She had just decided to leave a note when she heard the front door open and close. She arose and turned, hoping it might be Norton. The light footsteps in the hall told her it wasn't a man. A moment later, Heather came in. At sight of her mother, she halted as if she had run into a wall. At the same moment, both women opened their mouths to speak, probably something like, What are you doing here? or words to that effect. You look tired, Marina said. Perhaps you should come in and sit down. The landlord left a pitcher of water, if you would like some. Heather sat near the window without a word. For a long moment, she stared at her mother. Then she said, <clears throat> Why don't you tell me what's going on? Marina stared out the window, then glanced at the front door. Heather thought she was about to turn and leave. Instead, she sat down on the other side of the room. What have you heard? She said. Not much. It's more of a feeling I have. That something evil is on its way. Something bad is coming. An unwelcome visitor. Marina smiled with her lips, eyes sad. Sometimes you remind me of your father. At times, he used to speak of his feelings in that way. When he lay dying in the hospital, he said he felt that he was going on a journey, that he was waiting for his ticket agent. He warned me the entire nation was on a journey to somewhere we have never been, and there was no going back. But that's neither here nor there. I don't know what you have heard or where, but I suppose you're bound to find out sooner or later. Life is a one-way journey. I was married once before, several years before meeting Corporal Randall. I was young and foolish. Heather remained still, waiting for her mother to continue, but she did not. They merely gazed at one another. Finally, Marina's words sank in. The unwelcome visitor? He was your husband? He believes he still is, since there was no divorce. When I knew him, he was a gambler and a swindler. We dwelt in wedded bliss for about a year. He left town suddenly when he was caught dealing in counterfeit gold coins that contained more copper than gold. I don't know where he went after that. Truth to tell, I was relieved to see him gone. Now he turns up like a bad penny. He is the evil that comes our way. Marina shrugged. I don't know that he's much more evil than most. He never beat me or anybody else I know of. He never murdered or did armed robbery that I know of. He never ordered a hundred men to face cannon fire. But neither has he committed an honest day's work in his life that I know of. So, 
What does he want with us now, after all this time? Marina smiled. With you? I suppose nothing. I expect what he wants from me is money. He must have learned of my public success. Don't worry. I shan't invite him to stay. But it might be expensive to get rid of him. <laughs> Why not just tell him to leave? Now Marina looked uncomfortable. She stared out the window again. You're not famous yet, so you wouldn't understand. You see, my success depends on my reputation. The public is unforgiving. Lola Montez gets away with being outrageous because that is what the public expects or almost demands. What they expect and demand of me is to be of high moral and spiritual standards. The courageous war widow bravely raising a talented child. Heather shook her head as if trying to clear it. But how does this fellow turning up change anything? You don't see it, do you? Of course not. He could go to the papers or even to courts. He could accuse me of bigamy. That would be a great scandal. A blight on the name of Marina Randall. Heather stared at her, said nothing. Of course, I do have a defense. I could say Corporal Randall and I were never legally married. There's no proof of it, no record anywhere. But that would be an equally great scandal, wouldn't it? Silently, she began to weep, tears welling as if squeezed from a great depth. Heather crossed the room and embraced her mother. Half an hour later, the emperor returned. The two visitors had been about to give up and leave when they heard the door slam and the familiar clump of boots on the stairs. Joshua entered with a thoughtful, distracted expression, but when he saw them, he gave a broad smile. Good news! Mr. Hamilton is retiring! And who might that be? Marina asked. Ah! The thoughtful expression returned. Forgive me. I had forgotten you wouldn't know. What a delight to find you here, and Miss Heather as well. She followed me here. I see. Well, Mr. Hamilton is a senior partner in Mr. Buxby's firm. This means that Mr. Buxby will at last be advancing. He becomes the most junior of the senior partners, with his own office lately vacated by Mr. Hamilton. Isn't that splendid news? I suppose so. But I actually came to see you about another matter. Oh, yes. I suppose it must be the same business that I was lately discussing with Mr. Buxby. He glanced at Heather. Naturally, you will wish a more private audience before we go into that. Never mind. Heather knows all about it now. She is by all means the nosiest young lady you will ever care to meet. Were you able to find anything out? Joshua took a seat nearby and laid his stick on the floor. He cleared his throat and loosened his tie, glancing again at Heather. <clears throat> well then, in fact, Mr. Buxby was quite helpful in the matter of information about this Simon Harker person. He sent wires to the sheriffs of several different counties. It appears Mr. Harker is known in Los Angeles and also Monterey, having been arrested more than once for petty theft. More importantly, he was recently discharged from a Mexican prison after serving two years for cattle stealing. Aside from that, his main means of support is believed to be gambling. <clears throat> I cannot imagine Simon as a rustler. Oh, he didn't actually steal the cows himself. He would purchase them from Mexican rustlers, then sell them across the U.S. border. A lucrative trade, I'm told. His last contact with the law was more than a year ago, current whereabouts unknown. <clears throat> His current whereabouts is the Valencia Hotel in this city. I was hoping there might be an outstanding warrant. No such luck, I'm afraid. May I ask what you intend to do? I intend to meet Mr. Harker. Beyond that, I couldn't say. Thank you for your efforts in my, on my behalf, Emperor. And be sure to thank Mr. Buxby, and to congratulate him. She got to her feet. Heather and I will be running along now. 
Let me know if I may be of further servants. I shall accompany you as far as the cable stop. I was thinking of trying a new free lunch counter, which I just heard about. Marina took the hint. She opened her reticule. Before we go, your highness, and lest I forget, I was hoping to invest in some more of your bonds. If you should happen to have any about, I think five dollars worth. Joshua smiled again. I am delighted to serve, madam. The Journal of Sarah Althea Hill I was shocked today to learn the truth of Miss Marina's current trouble. Not that I have ever been fond of the woman, but I began to appreciate what it means to be betrayed by a man, one whom a woman once trusted. I had thought to perhaps find some way to use her problem to my advantage. Perhaps I still may. Instead, I discover myself an urge to offer sympathy and support. I shall do so tomorrow. Sarah appeared at Marina's doorstep in the late morning, unannounced. She had not bothered to request an appointment and half expected Marina to tell her maid she was indisposed. Instead, she was kept waiting only a few minutes in the anteroom. She found Marina alone in the parlor. I'm sorry, there's no tea prepared, Marina said. Your visit is a surprise, but if you could be patient for a few moments. <clears throat> I did not come for tea. Sarah sounded more snappish than she had intended. I mean, please don't bother. Is your daughter about? What's her name again? Heather, is it? An unusual name for a Christian. I've never claimed to be one of those. Heather's visiting Ina for a day or two. They have become quite good friends. To what do I owe the pleasure of this sudden visit, Miss Hill? Sarah, unbidden, seated herself on the edge of a chair. I shall come to the point. I have heard about your problem with this Harker fellow. At this, Marina's face paled. Good God, if I made the papers already... No, no, not a bit of it. Perhaps with luck, this business will never become news. No, I learned of it through confidential sources. Let's call it the grapevine. I see. The grapevine, is it? Then I can only wonder. May I ask, Miss Hill, how the matter concerns yourself? It doesn't, not really. It's only that I feel constrained to offer my sympathy and support for what it may be worth. Marina was silent a moment, taking that in. <clears throat> well, then, I thank you for your sympathy, but I really don't see what support you might offer. Not that I'm in need of it. Perhaps not, but I am beginning to realize I myself am in a similar position, though it may be different for you. You at least have your profession and property. I might say, your wealth, to be rude. I have nothing but my wits. If the senator should turn me out, I know not what may become of me. Ah, oh, listen to me. I did not come to reveal my own troubles, only to offer you help in yours. Please believe me. I speak true. Perhaps I should be on my way. Marina had been watching Sarah's face, as if trying to read a book written in an unfamiliar language. She took a step closer and held out both hands. You needn't rush off. I take no offense to anything you've said, Miss Hill. I'm sorry to hear of your own troubles. Please don't worry yourself about me. Let me know if I can help you. Sarah turned to leave, tears starting in her eyes. She paused and gave Marina a strange look. If you wish, I could enlist the aid of two or three gentlemen to give your problem a stern talking to. Marina laughed. <laughs> Ruffians, you mean? I doubt that will be necessary, but I thank you for the offer. I'll be sure to let you know. Two days after this conversation, Sarah was again feeling put out, this time extremely put out. The Journal of Sarah Althea Hill My worst fears are realized. 
For some time now, I have suspected something of the sort. Now Mary Ellen's spies have kindly provided me with the truth. More, I verified the fact with my own eyes. Senator Sharon is keeping another woman. He is providing her with a room at the Baldwin, the very hotel where I used to live prior to meeting the senator. Mary Ellen advised me he visits her on a regular schedule, Tuesday and Thursday afternoons. Yesterday, I took a discreet position behind one of the large pillars in the lobby and observed him on the way in. I chose not to remain long enough to see how long he stayed. Most likely, it was overnight. This morning, I went to the senator's room in the palace. I confronted him directly and inquired of his intentions. I fear we had quite a row. In the end, he averred that he has no intention of remarrying myself or anyone else. Further, he has ordered me to vacate my room in 30 days. He's cutting off my allowance at once. He won't get away with it. I have a plan. First, I must have another consult with Judge Terry. The senator is in for a surprise. Chapter 14 Marina had not long to wait. She had chosen to meet Harker on Neutral Ground, a French restaurant on Montgomery Street. She ordered coffee with toast and jam. The waiter appeared disappointed, especially when she barely sipped the coffee and only nibbled at the toast. Twenty minutes after the appointed time, Harker showed up. She did not expect him to apologize for being late, nor did he. Without ceremony, he pulled out a chair opposite and seated himself. You haven't changed a bit, Marina. <clears throat> you have, Simon. You have lost weight, and the beard does not flatter your face. Have you been ill? I would hardly have recognized you. It's true. I've had some rough times. Your absence made it all the harder. I have often longed to see your face again. I'm not taking you back, Simon. I have my own life now. Is that what you wanted to know? He gave a theatrical sigh. <sighs> oh, Marina, you were always good at being blunt. Perhaps you do not know how much I've changed. I've become an honest man. We were happy once. And I was miserable once. But no more. Does your honesty include dealing in stolen cattle? He blinked. Where did you hear that? Oh, never mind. I suppose you have your sources. If you will permit me to explain. Won't be necessary, since I don't care. Why are you back in San Francisco, Simon? What was your plan? More counterfeit money? Now, Marina, that's hardly fair. You're not giving me a chance. It's true I'm temporarily between occupations and running short on cash. Marina picked up her cup, finished the coffee, and signaled the waiter for more. He brought over a fresh pot with a second cup. Will the gentleman be ordering dinner? No, he won't, Marina said, but he can have coffee and toast if he's hungry. The waiter departed. Simon looked at the toast for a moment, then snatched up a piece and wolfed it down. How much do you want? Marina asked. He gave her a wide-eyed look. You mean, how much toast, Marina? No, I mean how much money to go away again. He took a sip of coffee, looking thoughtful. He lowered the cup and stared into it, as if reading tea leaves. You were always a hard woman, Marina. By the way, how's your daughter, the love child? What's her name again? If you speak that way, I shall empty this hot coffee over your head. Understand how much money. Now he looked up and smiled brightly. Well, since you put it that way, I shall have to give the matter some thought. By the way, did you know I could have you arrested for adultery? It's against the law in this state. Not, of course, that I would actually do that. In any case, 
I believe there's a statute of limitations, but you think you could make trouble for me. All I'm asking is a fair shake. Look here, Marina, you're rich and I'm not. If you won't take me back, then you ought to divorce me. You should give me some sort of settlement. And for the divorce, you would have to claim infidelity, which would ruin my reputation. You were always a card sharp, Simon. You seem to be holding all the cards. He leaned back, picked up another piece of toast and smiled while spreading jam. He said nothing. Very well. <clears throat> Very well. I'll give you an answer, but I'll need a few days. I'm not as rich as you seem to. <clears throat> Very well. I'll give you an answer, but I'll need a few days. I'm not as rich as you seem to think. I'll need to examine my assets. I'll send you a note when I'm ready. Fine by me, long as you don't wait too long. There's just one thing, though. There's the matter of my current hotel bill. I had travel expenses, that sort of thing. Without a word, she dropped a $10 banknote on the table as she got up to leave. While Marina and Simon were conversing, Sarah was consulting not Judge Terry, but Mary Ellen. That lady was studying a spread of cards on her tea table. <clears throat> Something will need to be done about the railroad, she amused. <clears throat> By someone. The railroad? Sarah was baffled. The railroad had nothing to do with her problem, as far as she knew. Yes, Mary Ellen scanned the cards, one side to the other. Everyone thought the Western Pacific would bring progress and civilization to the West. Instead, it has brought tyranny. Oh, yes, the senator was discussing that the other day. The miners don't like it much. Vaguely, she recalled what she had read in the Chronicle and the Alta. The railroad owned half the state of California, charging what rates they pleased of the farms and factories. It was the latest political issue replacing slavery. Mary Ellen leaned back and looked at Sarah. <clears throat> A new kind of slavery, she said, of the pocketbook. This time the railroad is not underground. More's the pity. What do the cards tell you, Mary Ellen? Nothing I did not expect. You have a chance to prevail against the senator, but nothing is certain. You must act quickly with determination. Oh, I shall. I've already had a brief discussion with Mr. Terry. He agrees I have a chance. Mary Ellen gave her a quizzical look. What else did your judge say? Now Sarah felt uncomfortable, but she decided not to hold back. He, he asked me if I had any samples of the senator's handwriting. I mean, his signature. And do you? Of course, I have every letter and note he ever sent me. I also have a piece of blank paper with his name signed at the bottom. It was for the bank, you see, to verify his signature. He was to bring it to the Bank of California about a year ago, but he left it on his desk, so I kept it, thinking it might one day be useful. He'd forgotten all about it. Ah, oh, then. Perhaps I'd better not ask what Judge Terry intends it for. I see no other message in the cause for you. The Emperor seldom played cards, but lately he had begun indulging in a few games of penny-ante with Mr. Bannock. Usually Bannock had to stake Joshua, who agreed to play because it seemed to help the other man relax. Bannock had taken to remaining in his office well into the night, even after the pressman had gone home. I guess I'm getting an ulcer. Bannock remarked, studying his hand. Can't seem to keep anything down lately. Pass me that whiskey, would you? He took the bottle and poured himself a shot. What news do you hear of that problem of your friend Marina? You know about that, then? Joshua studied his, hands of, his hand of cards. Bannock discarded one and drew another. <coughs> Tales get about. Heather was in here a few days ago asking about it. She said she might write a notice for the paper. 
I hope it doesn't go that far. Bannock shrugged. I have no wish to harm your friend, but as I say, tales get about. I went so far as to look up the old police records, and I found a jail photograph of this hawker person. He pulled open a desk drawer and removed a small piece of paper, passing it across. This is a copy. As you know, I have friends down at the hall. Joshua picked up the print to study it. It was obviously made from an old tintype. <clears throat> he doesn't look like a desperado, except perhaps for the scar. <laughs> I understand he claimed it was a dueling scar. More likely some lady tried to knife him. May I borrow this, sir? <laughs> Why not? Now, are you ready to play cards, your highness? Mary Ellen read the headline on the late edition of the bulletin. She glanced up to study Sarah's face, then down again to read the headline once more, this time out loud. Senator Sharon sued for divorce. Friends stunned. Marriage is secret. Woman claims they were wed two years ago. Mary Ellen read on to herself, occasionally moving her lips or giving Sarah a strange look. <clears throat> so, you're going through with it, she said at last. Oh, yes. I have witnesses. I am suing for divorce on grounds of infidelity. I have a marriage contract signed in secret by myself and by the senator. Mr. Terry is certain it will stand up in court. The senator won't get away with his shenanigans. Mary Ellen put down the newspaper, neatly folded. Perhaps this has something to do with that paper you mentioned, the blank one signed by Mr. Sharon. Sarah merely, merely smiled. In fact, she beamed at the other woman. Of course, I would not be a party to fraud, Mary Ellen said. But since I know nothing about it, I guess I'm in the clear with man and God. I will help you any way I can, as a friend. Uh, thank you. I knew you would. This should be an interesting adventure. I shall be in court next week for the preliminaries. And what will you do now? Now? I believe I shall go and commiserate with my friend Marina. <laughs>